29, that's what that is about. Because the price of electricity has gone up uh, 61% if you're a small consumer and 30, um, uh, uh, 31, uh, here we go, and uh, 42% if you are large, a larger consumer. Now, we, I spoke to you briefly about what is happening because of this massive borrowing. Uh, in, the, in the language of uh, bankers and economists, we talk about the spread. The difference between if you have a few shillings and you put in a bank, if they pay you interest for your deposit and how much they are lending. What you will see is that that spread between what they pay Kenyans for their money and what they are lending, mainly government, that spread is going up. And that's, uh, so at the beginning of the year, it was 8.9. Now it is 9.8%. Why? Because government is driving up that spread in order to attract money to itself. And that's the point we are saying of um, uh, massive borrowing. And this is what then, in, uh, in that language, they talk about crowding out. So government is pushing out the private sector um, and taking most of the money to itself. And you can see the trajectory of the curve that, um, uh, you know, treasury bills and bonds are competing with the private sector and most of the money is going to them because they are paying much higher rates. Now, um, on the economic, uh, on, on the micro and small businesses, which is where the bulk of Kenyans are, what is happening there? In summary, more of us are hooking than we were a year ago. Uh, we are borrowing for things that we were not borrowing for last year, primarily education, and I'll show you the data in a moment, and we are defaulting more than we were doing last year. The, we are closing businesses more. Why? Because of lack of working capital. And um, roughly 60% of those who end up closing is after they have made tremendous effort to get it. So this is the data that I'm talking about. First, people are having to do more than one thing. So maybe you are, you are selling bananas, but you are also trying to sell something else, sweets or something like this. And that's the first uh, line there you are seeing. Those of us trying to do more than one thing has gone up uh, um, to uh, 19%. Where do we work from? As I said already, welcome uh, Your Excellency uh, Stephen Kalonzo. As I said already, we could be working in a cluster, we could be working in a market stall or a Juakali shed, we could be working online or from our homes, or we are hawking. We have no fixed abode and we're going from street to street. And that's what I want you to notice, that those of us who are working from a fixed place, whether a Juakali shed or something like this, that number has gone down to 21%. Those working online and from homes, that also has gone down. And most importantly then, those who are hawking has gone up. Now, the percentage who have been who are borrowing has remained roughly the same at around 55, 56%. Yeah. But remember, small businesses themselves, like uh, I hope your neighborhood kiosk, sometimes they extend you credit. You get milk and bread uh, to pay at the end of the week, ukipata kibarua. The percentage that are able to do that is declining. And that's what the next number is showing you that those micro and small businesses that have been unable to entertain their customers that way, that proportion is going up to 33%. Those who get goods on credit from uh, their supplier of bananas, <laughs> that proportion is going down by six percentage points. Meaning, micro and small businesses are facing an even tougher and tougher time. But I want you to take notice of the following. Why do they borrow, the small, micro and small businesses? They borrow, the top five reasons is obviously one, to restock. But we also borrow 
for household expenses you know for food at home and so on and the proportion of us borrowing for household expenses has gone up dramatically by 7% this is what i pointed to you earlier last year we were not borrowing for education now 23% of us are borrowing for education and those borrowing then to expand our business and uh, is is declining this data and um, the fourth estate you reported on it uh, a few days ago how many of the micros and small businesses are defaulting defaulting meaning you are paying late or you are paying less than you should pay or not at all that proportion has gone up dramatically to 61% uh, having risen by nearly 18% during the year that uh, Kenya Kwanza uh, or during the year that this regime has been in power i want to transition to dr karogo um, to take you through part of the social pillar and then bring up the rest of my colleagues i thank you very much uh, thank you as usual you did not touch the nairobi securities exchange and i will start from there good morning everybody uh, the, the way to tell how an economy is doing, really, in simple language, is to look at what's going on in its securities market. For instance, how is the NSE 20 share index and all share index doing? Now, the last year, um, the, both the NSE 20 share index and the NSE all share index have dropped to the point of 30%. Now, the story is with if you look at, for instance, market capitalization, meaning the value of the shares that are in the market. If you look at market capitalization, uh, this last year of Kenya Kwanzaa regime, market capitalization in the NSE has gone down about 29-30%. Meaning, whatever you had put, if you had, for instance, put in a million shillings in the NSE, it is now less in terms of value if you sold it, you would lose 30% of that. Million shillings, that means you'd lose how much? 300,000. So your worth is now 700,000. That is what is going on in the Nairobi Securities Exchange. And it is not about the earnings. It's not that the, the companies that are listed are not profitable. They are profitable. In fact, the profitability has remained st steady at about 60%. However, the price to earnings ratio has been halved from... 5.3 times, I mean, at the, the last three years of Uru's regime, the price to earnings ratio has been about 10, 10 times, meaning your price, uh, the, the share you buy, you will earn at least 10 times more in earnings of the share price that you get. That is now down to five times in the last year. So the NSC is, is a barometer. There you will tell exactly how um, Ruto's regime has done substantively uh, on matters economy. Uh, I want to address just three issues uh, in the social pillar, and I'll start with the education sector. Uh, as people who have looked at this sector, um, you will realize in the last year, the education sector has been perhaps one of the most disastrous sectors. In fact, we are saying that it has been so disastrous that even parliament themselves say that the 2022 examinations were the worst conducted. They were mad with malpractices. Cheating is back. It, it now, it, you know, the area where the, the CS is from or government officials are from must be ranked higher in examinations. And we have seen that. And we are saying that we have successfully, the Ruto regime has successfully ingrained malpractices and examination uh, integrity issues and the truth is in the fullness of time we will pay we will pay because we have uh, we are going to be producing uh, mediocre uh, people into the market and Kenya will pay so there are a few issues uh, yesterday's newspapers reported very well on issues of capitation not getting into um, the education um, institutions that is clear and it is across the board um, the issues of um, increased price of education. I mean, the price of um, education in this country during the Ruto regime has uh, increased by 225%, uh, causing a huge issue and a huge burden, especially uh, because many of these parents are already 
burdened by uh, the issues of cost of living. Uh, we have seen lots of stories around implementation of the CBC, um, and we think that the government should be concentrating on policy and resourcing, resourcing the CBC and not finding out if the system works or it doesn't work. Because by the time CBC was operationalized, a research had been conducted that that would be the way forward. Corruption is back um, in a big way if you look at what's going on in the TSC and the NEC. And I know that when they were reading the budget, they told us that the uh, education sector is the greatest gainer of that budget. I think it uh, currently is 27%, 27.6% 27 of um, the current budget. Uh, and this money is going to TSC. However, the money is going to pay teachers to get more, so to, to advance their popularist uh, sort of agenda. Uh, and now what we are seeing in uh, weekends, and I think the fourth estate is here, they have reported that as well. Um, over the weekends, MPs have letters that they're issuing to higher teachers and what uh, were kwa jeshi. So the role of TSC has essentially been politicized. And uh, uh, this, this, in my view, should be, um, in our view, sorry, should be regularized. The issues of uh, the Kenya National Examination Council, uh, leaking examinations and um, uh, everything that is, that goes on in K KNC has become more alive in the last year or so. Um, issues of inequality in education between public and private schools. We are seeing a government that promised, and on the right side of my slide, you will see the many promises, and I know the media uh, has highlighted that a lot of times. But one that uh, that is clear is that they actually had indicated that they would invest in research and uh, bring to life the Science Technology Innovations Act of 2013 that then proposes uh, an increase of resources, uh, the resources that go into research from 0.8% uh, of the GDP to 2% 2, 2 of the GDP, which has not happened essentially. If we go into health, health has been another disaster. Um, what this regime is trying to do is claw back on devolution. Health is a devolved function. We realize that it was devolved, however, the resources have remained at the top. This last budget, 37 billion, was put to the national government. What business does the national government have to do with health when the people dealing with healthcare are the governors? So uh, we have seen issues of clawing back on devolution, especially in the health sector. Uh, the other day you had the CS uh, mention that uh, they would like to now establish an emergency fund. I mean, it's the most obnoxious thing that can happen. If you have an emergency today in the village, do you go to Kenyatta Hospital in Nairobi or do you go to the dispensary next to you? You go to the dispensary next to you. So what the government should actually be doing is to strengthen primary health care so that if there is an emergency, uh, then that, the person goes and is treated at the primary level. That's not happening. We are seeing um, the funds being retained at the national government level. It, is, it has been established that universal health coverage across, across the globe is the way to go. Now, um, in uh, Huru's regime, there was four pilot counties that had been earmarked to pilot universal health coverage. I come from Nyeri, which was one of the pilot counties. Now, in that one year, we were able to conduct a research that then determined how many indigents, how many people cannot pay for health care. The same was handed over, we want to believe, to Ruto's regime. So we want to ask, what happened to universal health coverage? When they report about it these days, it sounds like a new phenomenon that they don't that they are not understanding. And ideally, all the, the research said was strengthen the primary health care system. Give more money to the dispensaries, to the health centers, and to the community, community health volunteers and the community health workers. One of the promises that they had made was that uh, uh, they would have a core pay system between national government and county government on uh, how CHVs um, are paid. That we have not seen work because governors are the ones in charge of you know, primary health care. The, the truth of the matter is that uh, there has been a 200% increase of primary health care um, um, prices across the country. 
if you go to the dispensary next to you and uh, it's your homework this weekend, uh, what you are paying 50 shillings to access, they, they call it a card. It's a copy, really. Today is about 200 shillings. So there's a, a 200% increase uh, of primary health care. So essentially, what does that do? It limits uh, access and it, you know, it limits people from... Uh, 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 you know, accessing healthcare. The collapse of NHIF, we have all seen what's been going on with, uh, with NHIF. They had promised that, in fact, NHIF would be free by December of 2022. That is a promise on record. Uh, we have seen them dancing around the issue, cutting it up into different funds that really don't make sense. All, and all we are saying is NHIF requires just a little structuring and it, will, it was working perfectly. If you listen to the CS and she said that uh, it was structured for employed people, that there's nothing that is further from the truth because we were, people who are not employed were paying NHIF um, through, pay, through a pay bill and that would have just worked perfectly. Uh, the issues of go slows, you've seen the go slows, and go slows are occasioned by delayed in salaries, delays in salaries across, um, you know, across all spectra. Um, make your dispensary is open, like my dispensary in my village is open two days in a week, so two out of seven days. The other five days, you can't access primary health care, you know, in the villages. Why? There's uh, go slows, and I think we recently received a strike notice uh, from the doctors. The inequality in access in rural areas, I've already talked about that. The, we have seen um, corruption and mismanagement, uh, especially in KEMSA. Uh, the resource allocation, like I alluded to before, um, in counties, uh, to counties, and uh, the UHC um, agenda, which has remained uh, by and large undone. If we move to social development and gender, if there are people who have been woodwinked in this regime and by this regime, uh, it is the women of this country. Everything from the pre-election promises of how many women will be in cabinet and how women will have access to markets and, uh, you know, all those promises have been not met, but they have been broken. <clears throat> so... Uh, the gender issue is a big issue and, uh, you know, you can just go and research the many promises that uh, were promised to women and all of them have been uh, broken from the free diapers for our children when we deliver to Linda Mama, which was a fantastic program that uh, was uh, had been initiated by the previous regime, now not working, to the full implementation of anti-FGM laws. So the gender issue... Um, in our view, this government has really not um, looked at the gender matters. There's been poor access to retirement benefits. I think uh, I, I saw that reported. And the reason why you cannot access your retirement benefits in this regime is that NSSF has been forced to, uh, to invest in government. If you look at who is buying the bonds in the Nairobi Securities Exchange every day, uh, just last week they... Is it yesterday, the day before yesterday, they raised 34 billion. Who is buying? It is NSSF that is buying. It is a few banks. So ideally, your money, which you're supposed to access um, when you retire, has been put in, the, in long term um, bonds in the stock market. And therefore, uh, people cannot access their retirement benefits. Delays of uh, payments, both in Linda Mama and in Nua Mama, uh, in uh, Linda, Linda Mama and in Nua Jami, you know, I already talked to that. The last uh, is the issue of youth. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the issue of the Talanta Hela uh, scandal. The issue of the Talanta. Oh, sorry. I didn't carry you along. <laughs> my bad. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the last one is the issue of um, youth sports and the creative, <clears throat> the creative economy. <clears throat> There's been a huge. Um, scandal around Talanta Hela that we also, um, the president launching and, uh, you know, having an acrobatic fit in, I think, whatever they were launching, saying that they have launched a program that um, uh, called Talanta Hela. And in exactly two weeks after that, Gladys Bosch-Sholei goes and says there is nothing like Talanta Hela. It was a scam. So, uh, 
youth sports once again uh, has been nothing but disastrous. You have heard about the issue of the Paralympics team. There are athletes complaining of delayed payments or non-payments at all, uh, corruption and mismanagement of their funds against a myriad of um, promises that included even free internet in all markets and in all schools uh, within the first 100 days uh, of, of these people being in, being in government. So I'll not go through the promises, but in our view, um, the youth, sports, and the creative economy, which was a great ticket item for them, remains uh, largely um, undone. Uh, with those uh, few remarks, allow me now to welcome um, P.S. Torome to take us through uh, housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caro, for that presentation. I continue with the social sector. And in the social sector, we are looking at the uh, housing. Uh, I'll also talk about land and environment, water, and a bit in agriculture. So I think there has been a lot of debate uh, with regard to housing, uh, particularly when the, this uh, government started the, the tax on housing. Uh, there has been a lot of debate about it. But one thing that is actually clear is opaqueness uh, in the implementation of the housing tax, because those people who are actually contributing to the housing tax, they will not benefit from it. And that one uh, even became out very clear on Wednesday when there was this big debate about the, the Kenjakwaza performance. There, is, there has also been promise on the limited access to mortgage uh, finance due to soaring of interest rates. Just as the governor presented, there has been an increase in the interest rates. So that one is making it difficult for those people who want to own homes through mortgage to access because of the high interest rates. And then there have also been the issue of land titling, and uh, there has been one case in Samburu where people are issued a title and then the, those issues were actually revoked. And then the, the house affordability, that is the rent which people pay, uh, has actually uh, increased due to the high cost of, uh, to the low cost of income. But there is one perspective that I want to bring. We have been debating a lot about the issue of housing, but from the report from the government, the government intends to raise the rule taxes, uh, that is housing tax. It is actually supposed to generate 73 billion, but 50 million houses. No, 250,000 houses. What does that mean? On average, one, the unit cost per house is 292,000. The big question is, what kind of a decent house can you build with 292,000? Let me give a very practical example. If you have just started, maybe sometimes you bought a small plot in Siokimau or even a small plot in Kitengela, in Rangao, in Nongaterongai, because in Rongai now you cannot get a house just next to the main road. You have to move to cross the river and go to a place we call Rangao or even Tuala. If you have that one-eighth plot that you bought, and you just and because the, the for a, a, a middle income family, an ideal house is a two bedroom house. If you are to build a two bedroom house in Langau or in Kitangela, it will roughly cost you one point five million. So if that is the case, then with the seventy billion which the government wants to use to construct two hundred and fifty, uh, 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 it can only they will be very lucky to construct fifty thousand houses by year. Because if you divide the 23 billion by 1.5 million, that one will be about 49 point something, something. So this government will be very lucky to construct 50,000 houses. So that target will not be met. And, it is, uh, and we even do not know who will benefit from the few that will be constructed. Or, or the, or, or, so that one, the issue of, the issue of housing, no wonder, there is a prophet who says that is a stupid idea. I may not be at the luxury of using that language. Lakini jijazia web wenyewe. And then there is the issue of water. As we have seen, 
since this government took over power. They have been running to open small. In fact, the money, the amount of money that they spent to go and open a tap of water is more than the money that was used to construct that project of water. So why waste so much? And sometimes they even use a helicopter to go and open a water tap in Kiambu. <laughs> so you can see. And I can even go back to the housing that I have just mentioned. When you talk about the 73 billion, we are not sure how much money will be used for administrative cost. Because even to go and open a housing scheme in Ruai, they will have to use helicopters. So the, the, the 73 billion will actually not go directly to the construction of the houses be, because there will be so many administrative costs. So we are waiting at the end of the year when Kenya National Bureau of Statistics publishes this statistics through the economic survey. We shall see how many houses have been constructed by the government using that money. But as, the, as you can see, it's very serious. So the other thing that I would like to talk about, the water towers are very important. That is where the rivers that actually supply us with water, they raise from the Mau Highlands, the, the Abadeas, the Cherangani, uh, Elgon, even some parts of Kilimanjaro, even in the Mount Kenya and Waterview. But you see, this is very ironical in our country. When we are in an international conference, we pretend to be climate change experts. Uh, we even host an international conference on climate change. But internally, we are allowing people to log. So what, what does that mean? We want to attract the new credit, United Carbon Credit money. <laughs> but we are destroying our own natural resources, which give rise to our water. Remember, Kenya is a water deficient country. So uh, when we start experiencing drought, it is because we are not managing our, it is because of our reckless decision of allowing logging to continue. So, and then there is the issue of agriculture. Okay, just as the, uh, the, the governor said, we fertilizer, but that baba harvest is because of good rainfall. So, instead of putting measures to stop relying on rain fed agriculture, we are still talking about fertilizer all the time. And the other thing, just as the governor said, you know, we have to link whatever I am presenting, I link it to what the governor said. He talked about how the cost of living is going up. But the cost of living is worsened when the prices of goods and services go up, and at the same time, your income also goes down. How is that happening? The farmers, the prices being paid for tea, coffee, macadamia, and other products, they're actually going down. So that one is actually worsening the cost of living. And a lot needs to be done with regard to that. Uh, so I have also talked about that, but finally, as I, in fact, I am the presenter who has taken the shortest time possible because I am always a man of very few words. <laughs> but, the, okay, that one is not in our slide. But there is one mess that we are doing as a country. As we all know, everybody in Kenya, we have always been talking about Vision 2030. And Vision 2030 is about six years to end. 2030 is just about six years to come to an end. And even we have been planning using Vision 2030. But... Since Kenya Kwanza took over government, our, when we left the government in December, we were supposed to have come up with medium term plan four, which runs from 2023 up to 2027. It is the one that is used to, to, to implement the vision, the vision 2030 or the projects in the vision 2030. But so far, the budget has been read, but there is no medium term plan that has been launched for the government to start planning and as and also meeting the aspiration of vision 2030 and even the finance act is very clear before every a, any government uh, uh, ministry or even uh, agency uh, is allocated money by the national treasury the apfx says that you must have a plan even for the county government for them to start receiving money from the national government to implement their plans they must have what we call the county integrated development plans but when at the national level we have not allowed the media term plan we don't expect the counties to follow a, a good example of the national government so the, the implementation of vision 2030 under the kk government is actually doomed i rest my case 
Uh, I now take this opportunity to call uh, Wakili uh, Paul Bwagi to make a presentation on his edit. Uh, thank you very much. My area is about uh, legal and constitutional. And uh, first and foremost, we our marking scheme on legal and constitutional issues is Article 10 of the Constitution, which uh, provides for national values and principles of governance. And our take is that on all aspects of uh, Article 10 of the Constitution, the Kenya Kwanza government has performed below par on all aspects of that article. Uh, we have split this presentation in, in, into different uh, fields, and there are seven of them. The first is on the issue of human rights. And uh, on human rights, we have seen a return of political arrests and in intimidation. Uh, this, the surprising thing is that the people doing this are the people who complained in the previous regime that they were being uh, politically intimidated through arrests and, and, uh, and charges. Uh, they have now brought that themselves. And uh, we have given two uh, very egregious examples First, uh, Baba's uh, security man was arrested and kept in communicado for three days when he could not contact anyone uh, and when he was uh, kept without food and interrogated, which was a clear attempt at uh, intimidating, intimidating Baba. We have also given the what happened to the blogger, uh, Pauline Jeroge, which we see as an attempt to make sure that they silence any person in the media who would want to tell the story of Azimio. Uh, the second part of human rights that we have dealt with is the issue of police brutality. Now, uh, maybe to say first that we have, as an opposition, we've been on the streets from 2013. We have demonstrated. We have met police. This has been the most brutal reaction that we have ever faced. And in the three months alone of protests, we lost 70 citizens who were shot point blank by police. Uh, that are possibly many more people. Uh, that are possibly many more people within three months than we have ever lost in the last 10 years of demonstration. Uh, surprisingly is that despite that unprecedented levels of brutality, uh, the president and his deputy have lauded the police for doing so and have even said that they are going to protect them uh, should anybody try to uh, make them accountable. Uh, the converse of it is that when uh, students and young people in Wasingishu said that they were going to demonstrate, unlike the reaction with Azimio, where our call for protest was immediately met with a warning and a cancellation of the demonstration, that did not happen and has not happened when demonstrations are called elsewhere, which makes it very clear that uh, these demonstrations, uh, these uh, actions are aimed at intimidating as, as a mirror. The third issue on human rights is concerning the report that was released the other day by the Independent Medical Legal Unit, in which they have said that in the last 11 months, they have recorded 128 cases of extrajudicial killings and that they have recorded 482 cases of torture. They say that in, in those 11 months, the torture cases have doubled. And in a similar time last year, the number of torture cases were 232, which means the Kenya Kwanzaa regime has possibly now one the highest rate of torture cases that we have seen. Now, in that circumstance, what our prognosis of the future is, I think Kenyans should expect that we are going to face much more brutality. And the reason for that is from the economic uh, picture that we've been given and uh, what Governor Derito has told us is that things are going to get worse. But governments that are unable to solve your economic problems the way they deal with the political consequences of it is to become more brutal. So let us expect that we shall have much more intimidation, there will be much more abuse of rights, 
there will be increased police brutality, there will be more torture, and invariably many more people will die arising from the failures, economic failures of the Kenya Kwanzaa government. That, that is our prognosis on that matter. Uh, the second head is on uh, undermining governance. Uh, we have seen and we started this uh, regime with a removal of all corruption cases from the people who were close to it. And our submission of it is that there seems to be a very subtle policy of ensuring that uh, the Kenya Kwanza government appoints corrupt individuals in all spheres of government. And if your idea of what you want to do with government is to do business, then one of the things you do not want is to have anybody of integrity uh, in a place of responsibility. Which brings us to the second issue, which is the contempt for ethics. And again, Chapter 6 uh, provides for the ethical standards of government. And uh, we have said that the Kenya Kwanza government has no regard to ethics and is total, totally contemptuous to the issues of public ethics. Uh, and we have seen that in the return of the imperial power or attempt to return the imperial power of the president to pardon uh, people who are convicted of offenses. Uh, and we have seen the last pardons that were made were even for people who are known children rapists were given pardon. People who had co committed corruption cases were given pardon. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, Azimio will be going to court to challenge for purposes of ensuring that we president cannot create impunity by attempting to promise people that the president can forgive you for if you are found guilty of a crime. And we have already seen that being employed where the police are concerned. Uh, the third is about the threats to the judiciary. Kenya Kwanza started by appointing the judges who had not been appointed by the previous regime and also by giving three billion shillings to the judiciary as a mark of their commitment to an independent judiciary. Of late, however, we have seen two things. First, the president has openly criticized the judiciary saying that it is obstructing its development agenda. And the reason for that is that the judiciary has stood against the executive when it has attempted to abuse its powers. And also recently we have seen another attack where the president has said that he's going to take, uh, to take action on corrupt judges. Now, we have a judicial service commission and it is the judicial service commission that deals with all issues concerning judges. So it is an abuse, a threat to judges and the judiciary for the president to assume the power or try to assume the power to deal with the judiciary. Uh, the third limp under interference with the judiciary is subversion of the cost of justice. Uh, this has been because, I mean, it has emanated from the threats uh, to people who had cases of mumias who are told that uh, they have to withdraw their cases. Uh, that is a denial of access to justice. Access to justice is a constitutional right directly guaranteed by our Constitution 2010. To threaten somebody who has gone before a court of law is to deny them access to justice. To threaten somebody who has filed a case is to deny them access to justice. Uh, the fourth limp is uh, undermining the Senate. And on this one, we are talking about the case of the Finance Act 2023. I, I will not go further into that because Azimio has did file its case against the Finance Act. And we were heard earlier this week. Uh, a judgment is going to be delivered, I think, on 24th of November. So we, we will wait to hear what the High Court has to say about that. Uh, the other issue is abuse of uh, environmental rights, which uh, P.S. Saitoti Turome has also talked about, and I'm not going to go back to that. And uh, then there is the undermining of multi-party democracy. First to say that 
the regime keeps saying that it welcomes opposition, but on the other hand, it is doing everything to ensure that there is no opposition. And it has done that by attacking Jubilee and uh, entering into the affairs of Jubilee. And even while the leadership of Jubilee has been in court, uh, the president has openly uh, recognized a faction of Jubilee as the legitimate function, which is the court that is supposed to pronounce as to who should be in charge. Uh, and then we have seen the buying of the members, the members of parliament of ODM party, an issue that uh, ODM has taken action on, and I will leave it at that because I believe that is also in court. Uh, the last issue we've dealt on this is inclusivity. Uh, we, we started by being told that the country has shareholders, and uh, we have all been told those who want to buy shares, be prepared in 2027. The stock, the political stock exchange shall be open again and make sure, make sure you buy your shares. So, uh, and we are saying that policy continues. So, uh, largely on, on legal and constitutional matters, I think the one message we would want to give Kenyans is that Kenyans need to be prepared, need to prepare to have courage and vigilance because we are about to embark on one of the most brutal eras in this country. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Karogo, I think, uh, I think in fact the whole team should uh, stand. Um, if there is a question you have before the technical team exits and um, the principals uh, give you the sum of what we have said. Um, and Dr. Karogo, I believe, has one additional point. Are there any explanations uh, the media would like? Okay. I just uh, wanted us to um, speak about the issue of credit rating. Um, all credit rating agencies have downgraded um, Kenya from a double B, I think we're now going into the C's, to a country that is not credit worthy. And that's, like I said, you can see what's going on in the stock market. When the stock market goes down, what essentially investors are saying is that we don't trust this regime. We cannot give you our money because we cannot trust you to pay. So a big story is also trolled by global credit rating agencies, which all have uh, agreed to downgrade. And we saw the African Union, I think, trying to fight back for Kenya, I think through the influence of this regime. But uh, those figures are scientific. Kenya is not credit worthy. Thank you. I also wanted to emphasize on what I talked about, about the cost of housing. And uh, just as the governor presented, when we see the cost of petroleum going up, uh, fuel, etc., they also affect the cost of construction because all the material must be uh, transported to the site. We also know that a lot of taxes has actually been put, like the cement we used to buy cement last month at 680, but now it is at 720. So this increase in the uh, in the cost of construction material is not only going to affect the government in achieving its uh, housing uh, projects, but also the private sector uh, will also be affected. That point must be taken into account. The cost of uh, construction material is actually skyrocketing because of the cost in, in transport as a result of cost in increase in fuel. I thank you. Um, any questions of a technical nature, uh, policy questions the principals would deal with? Well, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. So, a, a, a difficult, dismal, disastrous year. Take your pick. Um, may I now um, uh, return it to uh, His Excellency, uh, Right Honorable Raila Odinga, to give you the summary of what we have spoken about. I'll, I'll stand here. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have heard from our experts about what uh, 
we think is an objective assessment of the performance of this government. Uh, we did not want to be biased, and that's why we deployed experts. What they have produced to you here is a result of extensive research which has been done by some of our people. Some of them are in the universities who have taken time to come up with uh, this analysis. Lakini nataka kuseme machache kwa lugha ambayo wengine wanasikia. Sisi kama azimio tuliamua ya kwamba tutaangalia vile jao jamaa wanafanya kazi na baadaye sisi tutatoa maoni ambayo ni maoni ya kikweli kabisa. Meona jamaa wakikimbia mara kwa mara kutoka eneo hii na eneo hii wakitoa ahadi. Na ahadi ni nini? Kuna ahadi ambayo walitoa wakati walikuwa wanafanya kampeni. Kuna lugha walikuwa wanatumia wakati ile ambayo wanafanya kampeni. Hiyo lugha imebadilika baada ya wao kushika hatamu ya utawala katika taifa letu. Ku katika uh, eneo tofauti tofauti wamekuwa wanatoa ahadi tofauti tofauti. Lakini tunaweza kusema kwa jumla ati yale ambayo wamejaribu kufanya haija fika kile kiwango ambayo wananchi walikuwa wanatarajia. Kwa upande ya kilimo wamengurumwa mara mingi hapa na pale. Kwa upande ya mwindo msingi. Kwa upande ya elimu. Kwa upande ya nishati au kawi. Na kwa upande ya huduma kwa vijana kwa jumla, kwa upande ya ajira kwa vijana. Kilimo vile imesemekana hapo mvua imenyesha na kwa hivyo kwa upande ya chakula Uh, gharama ya yaani bei ya bidhaa kama mboga na, na kadhalika imerudi chini kwa upande ya miundo msingi kwa upande ya barabara na kadhalika wamekuwa wakizindua zile barabara ambazo zilitengenezwa na serikali iliyopita wamekuwa wanakimbia pande hii kuzindua miradi ya maji gharama ambayo wanatumia kwenda kuzindua gram hiyo miradi ya maji atinashinda pesa ambayo imetumika kutengeneza hiyo miradi kwa upande ya vijana ajira bado imekosekana na vijana wanahangaishwa hapa na pale eneo zingine kwa mfano mkoa wa wa wakati wa eneo hii ya mlima huko vijana wanahangaishwa hapa na pale ati wanaingia katika mambo ya ulevi vijana wanashikwa wanapigwa wanawekwa ndani ikifika saa 12 usiku ni kama umerudisha ile hali ya hatari ya mkoloni na zi tunasema hakuna kijana yeyote ambaye anangependa kuingia kwa mambo ya kuulevi bure Vijana wanaingia kwa mambo ya ulevi kwa sababu ya ukosefu ya kazi, ukosefu ya ajira. Sasa wewe unaadhibu mtu na hujampatia namna. Pale hilo mbele kulikuwa na mpango tulifanya wakati tulikuwa na kibaki. Hata Rais Uhuru alijaribu kuleta ile kazi mtaani. Tulikuwa tunaweza kazi kazi uh, kwa vijana kama ungeweza kupatia vijana ajira vijana hawezi kushughulikia mambo hii ya ulevi na, na kadhalika lakini vijana wanahangaishwa kwa sababu ya ukosefu ya kazi kwa mambo mengine ni mambo ya ya ugatuzi ugatuzi tulileta 
ile huduma iji karibu ni wananchi na katiba yenyewe imetenganisha zile uh, uh, mambo ambayo yanatakikana yatekelezwe na serikali ya ugatuzi lakini hii serikali ya Kenya kwanza au Kenya kwisha imeingilia mambo ambayo yanatakikana ifanyike na serikali ya ugatuzi unaona kwa upande ya kilimo wameingia sasa wao ndi wananunua mbolea wanagawanya kwa uh, serikali ya ya, ya 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 county lakini kilimo ni moja ya ile sekta ambayo imegatuliwa wameingia kwa upande ya hiyo ya kununua mbolea na kuleta kwa sababu ya mambo ya ofisadi upande ya ujenzi ya manyumba hiyo vile vile imegatuliwa lakini sasa wanataka wao ni wanakuja wanajenga manyumba alafu wanapatia serikali ya counties kwa upande ya masoko wanataka wao ndi wajenge masoko ndi wapate serikali ya counties kwa upande hii ya industrial parks na kadhalika ako upande ya mabarabara yote yameingia na hii yote ni kwa sababu ya mambo ya ufisadi ndio unaona hapo tuko na shida vile vile hapo tumekosoa kwa upande ya utawala kwa jumla bwana uh, mwangi ameongea juu ya mambo ya state capture ya, ya, ya institutions mliona juzi mfanyi biashara moja anatishwa anaambiwa ati mambo ni matatu uhame utoke Kenya pili ni kuweke jeo jela au tatu ni kupeleka mbinguni haya yote ni matamshi ambaye mtu hawezi mtu ambaye anajiita rais hawezi kutumia kutisha wananchi na vile vile tuma mahakama sasa zimeshikwa zimeweka zimeshikwa mateke unaona vile jamaa anamwambia uh, mheshimiwa uh, okia mtata ambaye alikuwa amepeleka kesi mahakamani ati unaharibu wakati yako mimi ni rais uwezi kunishinda nitakushinda hata kule kwa mahakama kwa hivyo tayari yeye amejua matokeo ya hiyo kesi ambayo bado iko mbele ya mahakama bunge vile vile imetekwa nyara bunge imetekwa nyara wakati huu ameingilia hata kwa upinzani vyema viazimio kama vile jubri amechukua wabunge wengi pande ile wanataka kuchukua jubilee sasa iwe atini moja ya vyama ya Kenya kwanza wanaingia vile vile kwa wabunge wa ODM wanaona vile wanaviongea vile wanavisifu serikali watafanya pamoja na serikali na wao wanasema wao ni wanachama wa ODM hayo yote ni kuhakikisha kwamba hakuna upinzani katika bunge kumaliza vyema vya upinzani ili Kenya irudi katika utawala ya chama kimoja ya mama na baba kwa upande mwingine umeona vile gharama ya maisha imepanda na juzi wameongeza tena bei ya mafuta ambayo itasababisha kuongezeka ya bei ya bidhaa na gharama ya maisha katika taifa letu. Jana tumeona kama ile shirika ya, ya yani waajiri Federation of Kenya Employers ndio naongea wakilia kwa niaba ya wafanyikazi. Chama ambaye imewekwa pale nitakana ikoe inatetea wafanyikazi ambaye ni kotu. 
imenyemaza kimya alijasikia totu sauti ya kotu ato kidogo bwana atuli hayuko mapale mjoroti chenzi sana hii ndi wakati ambaye ingekuwa kotu angekuwa kwenye mstari wa mbele ikiongea kitetea wafanyikazi gharama ya maisha ya kipanda lakini sasa yule shirika ambaye ni waajiri ndio inaongea ninalia kwa niaba ya wafanyikazi kuna kitu mbaya zaidi na ambaye imenifanyika hapa hiyo vile vile ni state capture kotu imeingia katika mpuko ya serikali sasa kati ngine sisi tulisema ati punda imechoka tulisema punda imechoka leo tunasema punda imeanguka mzigo mzigo kubwa zaidi sasa punda imeanguka chini wakati tafika hivi karibu inakuja tuta ongea na wananchi lakini vile vijua tumekuwa tukisanya masahii kutoka kwa Kenya. Mahii tumesaisa tumesanya uh, imeshafika milioni kumi na zaidi. Sasa ime, imetosha gari. Na tunajua yale kile ambacho tutafanya na hiyo sahii. Mara hii haitakuwa tisi tunaambia wananchi warudi kwa barabara. Hapana. Wakaenchi wakirudi utarudi kwa mambo mengine tofauti kabisa. Sitaki kusema wakati huu manake nitakuwa mimi nimetoa maneno mapema lakini wakati huu watu wetu wanasongea na wale watu pande hii lingine lakini na wa Kenya kwa kimombo naweza kusema watch this space asante sana mwisho kabisa sasa this assessment has been done and we have done the, the rating on the basis of the information you have received here our scorecard for this regime is 30% that is d minus asadizan Do you understand it? As a reason.